God is good. All the time. And all the time. For the presence of the Lord is, it is holy. We have the Spirit with us. We have God at work. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, chapter 33. Exodus, chapter 33. Second book of the Bible. Clear back in the Old Testament, so right near the beginning. Exodus, chapter 33. All right, so Exodus chapter 33 is where we're going to be in a bit. Church, uh, the key to church success as a church for us to be successful for the kingdom of God is more than Bible preaching or good teaching, okay? Okay. The key to church success is more than Bible preaching or good teaching. It is the presence of God. His power manifest. His spirit baptizing and sanctifying. When we neglect or ignore the presence of God, all the preaching and all the teaching won't matter. Because it is the presence of God, the power of God, that makes the difference. And we need to be serious about that. We need to take that seriously. Worshiping God, praying God, seeking God. Uh, As I was writing this, I was reminded of years ago, this uh, mother I remember talking to. And um, in my memories, I remember her... Coming to church, she came to church, right? Right. But during the singing, she'd be off elsewhere. Her, she'd be talking to her neighbors. She'd be uh, looking at different things. During the prayer time, she wouldn't be praying. She'd be doing other things. And, and during the preaching, she wouldn't be listening to the preaching. She'd be doing other things. I remember all these things of this mother who just wasn't in it, you know? She was there, but she didn't take the praying seriously. Um, she, she was elsewhere, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I remember that. And uh, pray, uh, before the offering, instead of praying for the offering, she'd be digging around in her purse or something, you know? And she wouldn't take prayer seriously. She didn't take the worship seriously. And then when her son became a teenager, she comes to me and tries to blame me for her son calling her a hypocrite. Um, You know, our kids see this, right? People see when we don't take church, when we don't take prayer, when we don't take scripture, we don't take worship seriously. People see that. And so we have a duty to our own relationship with God and to those around us to as a church take seriously the need to pray, to worship, to seek God, to study His Word. Or one day someone's going to look at us and call us a hypocrite because they'll have seen us, our actions speak louder than our words, right? And so my goal is to call all of us To really be serious about our relationship with God. To really be serious in prayer and seeking God. And loving on God. Not allow distractions. Not allow talking to our neighbors get in the way of what God wants to do today. We spend too many times talking to other people. Complaining online complaining instead of seeking and praying and worshiping, right? Too often in church, we can tell you all the things that all the people around us did. We can tell you all about the distractions 
interactions that happened, but we can't tell you what God did in the service because we care more about other things. So, all right? What that reminded me of is our passage today. The context is the golden calf. You know that story? Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And he's up there. And, and you know, if we really want to hear from God, we need to sometimes get alone with God and leave everything else behind. Go up onto the mountain and pray and talk to God. And that's what Moses was doing. He was having a conversation with God. He was getting away from everything else to hear what God was going to tell him. What God was going to tell the children of Israel. But as he was up there, the people got restless. They started wondering, oh, Moses isn't coming back. It's taken too long. And so they made a golden calf to worship instead of God. Yep, they did. God took too long for them, and so they turned elsewhere. You ever heard of that happening? Yep. God took too long to answer this. God took too long, and so they turned to other remedies. They turned to other things. We need to let God do things in his way and his timing and trust him. All right? That's a whole sermon in itself, which I'm not going to get into today because that's not what I'm preaching. <laughs> but Moses comes down from the mountain, and he looks, and he sees the people worshiping this golden calf. And he's so angry, he throws the tablets on the ground and breaks them. He rebukes Aaron for going along with it and not leading the people. He went along with their sin, went along with their idolatry, and let them do whatever they want instead of leading them. Sometimes things like that happen when there's bad management. The other day, Carrie and I went through a, a drive through ordered some coffees and some other things. And uh, we get up there. The couple of cars ahead of us got tired of waiting at the, the order, place you order the, the speaker, and they drove off. We get up there. There's a couple of cars ahead of us, and we're sitting there, and we're sitting there. They help the one car, it goes off, and we're at the window, and we're still sitting at the speaker, and we're waiting and waiting. The next car gets helped and it drives off we're still waiting carrie's like trying to talk and saying stuff in the speaker no one's responding finally someone gets on there and says oh oh i'm sorry and then they take our order and then we get up to the window and everything was just crazy in there a bunch of teenage girls trying to run the front the window and the the register and no managers in sight and they did it again. The cars behind us at the speaker drove off because they were getting tired of waiting for the, the girls to get to them. Uh, the girl that took our order, or took our money and was typed, she had her gloves on, took our money, typed a bunch of things on the, on the computer, gave us our change back, and then went and made our food with the same gloves on. Uh, that's, as you know, that's, that's not good. No. Um, that's the same. That's right. To me, I could be angry at the girls, but what it's a sign of is bad management. The managers weren't around. They weren't, the manager wasn't there to help them do everything the way it was supposed to be done, right? Right. I'm not saying. <laughs> I had a feeling you would. We saw her there. Yeah. She was there. I felt sorry for her. Um, no, we, we, we did. We are. <laughs> it's a mess, I bet. Uh, but anyway, I'm not saying because that's the last thing I need. Um, but anyway, the idea is bad management. And Aaron was supposed to be leading the people of God, and he let them just do whatever they want. He didn't lead them. And a couple things popped in my head as I was writing this and I was thinking about that is one, we can have bad leadership in church. 
We need to have good leadership in church where our teachers and our preachers and everyone in leadership is committed to the mission. Committed to following Jesus. Committed to what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes you have power struggles. I'm not sure what the politically correct way is to say too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I remember hearing that was good. I'm sure there's a politically correct way to say that nowadays. But the, <laughs> too many cooks in the kitchen. There you go. Um, but that's the idea. Is too often in church we have so many people, so many of their own ideas that leadership goes right out the window, and everyone does whatever sounds good to them, and instead of just pursuing God, right? And the same way in church we could have all this leadership. But it needs to be following what the great leader tells us to do. Right. The Holy Spirit is our manager. Mm-hmm. And if we aren't following His lead, if we aren't following His guide, then it's going to be chaos. It's like it says in this passage in uh, Exodus 32, 25. It says, Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. I like that. Well, I, I like how it puts it. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much of the amusement of their enemies. They were out of control. What are we being controlled by? I talk a lot to non-believers, to the unchurched. And I hear them mocking the church for worldliness, mocking the church for hypocrisy, mocking us for our wishy-washy beliefs, for not taking a stand. They make fun of us because they see hypocrisy. They see the errors. They see the things we do wrong. You know, I, I want to just be made fun of for being a Christian, for being genuine, for believing what the Bible says, for following God. I want to live in such a way that that's what I get made fun of for, not for being a hypocrite, not for being wishy-washy, not for all these other things. If we're going to get made fun of as a church, I hope it's because we're standing for holiness, we're standing for God, we're, we're genuine and we're real, and let them make fun of us for that. But too often they see the hypocrisy in the world, sees it in the church, the worldliness in the church. And that's not good, is it? No. Moses asked God to forgive the people. At the end of the previous chapter of our text, Moses asked God, please forgive them. You know how God responds? Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. That's repeated again in Revelation, where it talks about those who sin against God, who fall away. Their names are blotted from the Lamb's book of life. God takes sin seriously. He says, God, please forgive them. Whoever sinned against me, I'll blot out of my book. Why do we take sin so much more lightly than God does? We make excuses for it. We act like we can live any way we want. Just ask God, forgive us anyway. It's not how it works. God takes sin very seriously. Which leads up to our passage for today. Exodus 33. In our text, we're going to see after their sin, the people repenting and revival, which is what we need today. Start in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. And go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivitites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, 
But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Sometimes God just calls it how it is, doesn't he? Saying for your own good, I'm not going to go with you because if I go with you, I'm going to, I might destroy you because of your sin, because you're stiff-necked. Now they're going to get what God promised. He tells them, you're going to get what I promised, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're going to get the promised land. But I'm not going to be with you. And I'm going to send an angel to take you there. They're going to receive the promise, but without God. You know, we can have church without God. We can have a form of godliness without God. We can appear to be some of the best Christians in the world. We can have the blessings of God without God. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do do the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, On judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and do lots of miracles in your name? Then I'll tell them, I've never known you. Get away from me, you people who do wrong. The people are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do miracles? And you think of like Christians on fire with the Spirit. You know, yeah, miracles are happening. They're prophesying. Demons are being cast out. That's what you think of when the Holy Spirit is on the move. And Jesus is saying, well, they were doing it without me. We can have a form of church without Jesus. We can have a form of Christianity without the Spirit. We're told that over and over in Scripture. And so we have to be careful that we aren't having a form of religion without Jesus. God can hear prayer and God can work in a situation and God can send miracles. It doesn't mean that we have Him. It doesn't mean that He is going with us. All right? And so the people, they heard this that they were receiving the promise and they heard that they would still dominate, they would still possess the promised land, that an angel would give them victory. How did they respond to that? They were getting all the promises, but God wouldn't be with them. How did they respond? Verse 4. When the, perp- when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord has said to Moses, tell the Israelites you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now, take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. You know, they were smarter than many today who settle for a godless religion, who settle for a church without the Spirit, who settle for Christianity without Christ. They were smarter than that. And they began to mourn. They took off their ornaments, their their, their jewelry, their, their signs of status. Their ornaments, that's what symbolized who they were and the power and authority they had, where they were in society. And they took them off. They took off their ornaments and they humbled themselves before God. A church that is seeking revival, seeking a move of God, is going to humble itself before God. Christians that are serious about receiving the Holy Spirit are going to humble themselves. Set aside symbols of status. Set aside who they think they are and and the pat on the backs that the world gives them. And they're going to say, you and you alone do I need God. We don't need all these other things. Because if God is not in it, I don't want it. Him and Him alone is what we need today. And then we're going to skip down to a conversation between Moses and God. 
Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. So here, Moses pleads with God to teach him, to lead him, to direct him, to give him wisdom. And then he reminds God, you know, these are your people too, God. These are your children. Then verse 14 The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God says, okay, here. And he says, I will go with you. He is referring to just Moses. He says, all right, all right, Moses, I'll go with you. My presence will be with you. Moses goes on to ask about the rest of them. Verse 15, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, plural, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? God tells Moses, I will go with you. And and Moses says, God, don't send us unless you go with us, all of us, because we are your people. That's a sign of a good leader. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in just making a name for himself. He cared about the people that God had put him as a shepherd over. And he says, God, don't just anoint me. Don't just go with me. Send your presence on your people. Go with us. And if you aren't going to go with us, then don't send us. Because we don't want to go if you're not going. Verse 17, And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now, Show me your glory. God says, okay. Because you are faithful, Moses, because you have stayed true, I am pleased with you because we know each other. I will go with you all. And Moses is excited. He says, yes, now, God, show me your glory. One commentary says that this hunger for more of God is a mark of true revival. Whatever Moses had experienced with God, he now wanted more. The more a man knows God, the more he desires to know him more. That's one thing, if if we're going to have revival, if we're going to have a move of God... We're going to find out the more of God we have, the more insatiable we'll be for more of God. The more we drink of the Spirit, the more we're going to want. The more we're going to desire and yearn to see God move. Because God is the greatest addiction we'll ever have. Amen. And we need a church that's addicted, that wants more, that wants to get deeper into God and be so sold out to God that we don't want anything else. All we'll want is Jesus Christ. You know, we can pray for miracles and we can pray for the church and we pray for missionaries. We pray for our own efforts. We pray that God... But real prayer goes deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's the seeking of God himself. Instead of seeking the things God can do, it's the seeking of God him very self, his very self. So what can we learn today from this passage? First, first order of business, I think, 
is we need to repent of our idols. Now, we might not have a golden calf set up in our living room, but we have a, a box in many of our living rooms that we might worship. Shows, shows and movies and things on it that might be a bigger priority to us than God. Idols are anything that steals our whole devotion to God. If God says, hey, will you surrender this person? Will you surrender this thing? Will you surrender this entertainment? Will you surrender this to me? And if we can't wholly, devotedly say, yes, Lord, then we love it more than God. It's an idol. God needs to be first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourselves. The two greatest commandments. So anything that keeps us from loving God with all our hearts is an idol. And we need to be careful that it doesn't dim our love for God, that it doesn't drag us away from God. Because it will if we're not careful. So first of all, I think this shows us we need to repent of our idols. Secondly, they had to move from wants to needs. They wanted the promised land, but they needed the presence of God. We can want blessings, but what we really need is the one who blesses. And spiritually, we can be confused on this where we're chasing after the wants instead of what we down deep truly need. Preachers can seek after powerful preaching talents, taking classes on how to preach well. Teachers can seek skills and learn how to be a better teacher. Christians can seek miracles. And the list goes on of all the wants that we can seek after, but that's only wants. What we need is Jesus Christ. What we need is God. We need to be careful that we understand the difference between wants and needs. We may want these things that are good in and of themselves and ignore what we need most. And the third thing we see here is this prayer this thing that Moses said to God, that should be part of our prayer as well. God, show me your glory. Show me your presence. Reveal yourself. All these things are going to burn up one day. All these things around us are going to be destroyed. Nobody in this church is going to get you to heaven. Nobody here bled and died for you on a cross. There is no other way except Jesus. Being a member of a church, being a teacher, a preacher, a superintendent of a denomination, that will not save anyone. What we need is to stand before God and be able to know that we know him and he knows us. And we don't have to worry about him saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Because it is our relationship with God that will save us. He is the way. It's all about him. And that's what I've been trying to say this morning over and over in different ways is that it's all about him. This idea of Moses saying, God, if you're not going to go with us, don't send us. We don't want to go. And that should be our desire as well. God, if you're not going to be in this church, God, if you're not going to be in my marriage, if you're not going to be in my home, my job, my everything, God, if you're not there, I don't want it. May we as a people pursue God above all else. May we as a church seek him first and his righteousness. 
And all the other things that need to happen here will happen if we seek him first. It's all about him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your promises. But Lord, I thank you most for you. Your love and your grace, your patience with us, your, your mercy shown to us, and all the, the wonderful things that you've done and you are doing. What we need is you, God. So I pray that you will draw near to us as a church as we seek you. Draw near to us as we pursue you. All the things of this world, let them grow strangely dim in the light of your glory, of your beautiful face. Reveal yourself to us. Show us your glory. I ask the name of Jesus. Amen. That's pretty good.